How do you scale a web application from one user to one million or even one billion users while ensuring seamless performance and maximum efficiency? It sounds like a pipe dream at first, but if you're a software engineer, you know this isn't some wild fantasy. It's a carefully structured process that involves making precise technical decisions every step of the way. Let's say you have a web application. It has a UI and an API component. You've been developing this web application for a while and you're now ready to onboard users. Your next course of action is to deploy it somewhere users can have access to it. You typically start with both components deployed on a single web server somewhere in the cloud. Pretty standard stuff. Your web application is now live and users can interact with it. When a user wants to visit your web application, they enter your website, also known as your domain name, into their browser. Within seconds, your site appears on the screen. Simple, right? But here's what's really happening behind the scenes. The user's request for your domain name first goes to the domain name systems, also known as the DNS. The major role of the DNS is to translate domain names or websites to the corresponding IP addresses of the servers associated with those domains. The DNS translates that user-friendly name like umacodes.com into an IP address. The reason it's done this way is because it's a lot easier to remember umacodes than it is to remember IP addresses, which can also change over time. Once the DNS returns the IP address, let's say it's something like 15.10.23.24, the user's browser can now directly communicate with the web server. The browser sends an HTTP request to the server, which responds with HTML pages if the request was made to the UI or a JSON response if the request was made to the API. The browser also caches the IP address for future requests so it doesn't have to go to the DNS on every call. This is how users are able to interact with your web application. At this stage, everything, I mean the web application and possibly the databases, are running on a single server. It's the easiest way to get an application up and running. A single box handles everything, including the HTTP request for the UI and API, database hosting and queries, and serving static files. This setup is great for early development or small projects, keeping development fast and deployment straightforward since everything is handled on a single server. However, as your user base grows, this single server setup begins to show its limitations. Every single request, whether it's to the API, UI, or just to serve static images, is funneled through this one machine. This might seem fine at first, but traffic can suddenly spike and suddenly your server can't handle the load. The more requests it receives, the longer it takes to process each one, leading to slow responses or even downtime. With the growth of your user base, one server is not enough. You'll need multiple servers. One to host the web application and handle user traffic and the other strictly for the database. Now let's talk about databases. When starting out, many developers opt for relational databases, think MySQL or PostgreSQL. These are great for structured data and offer ACID compliance, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, ensuring that your database operations are reliable and follow strict rules. You've likely used these databases before and they work well for traditional use cases, especially when your data is structured, but as your user base grows and your system demands more flexibility and speed, you might want to consider moving to a NoSQL database, such as Cassandra, MongoDB, or DynamoDB. These databases handle unstructured data and are designed to scale horizontally more easily, especially for applications that require low latency access to massive data sets. Choosing between relational or NoSQL databases isn't just about preference, it's about your application's needs. If you need consistency and strong transactional integrity, relational databases will serve you, but for high scalability and when your data doesn't fit neatly into tables, NoSQL databases gives you more room to grow. Now, back to our illustration. As of right now, we have only one database server, but like our single server setup, once you start seeing real traffic, things will start to slow down. High traffic means the server is bottlenecked by CPU, memory, and I.O. limits. As traffic spikes, users will experience slow response times and the system could eventually crash under all that load. You will have a single point of failure. If the database server fails, your application will be down. To combat this, we're going to be doing something very interesting, but first, a quick word from the sponsor of this video, JetBrains. If you're like me and are constantly looking for ways to improve your development environment, JetBrains has just dropped some amazing news. Rider and WebStorm are now free for non-commercial use. This means you can get full access to two of the most powerful IDs on the market for free if you're learning, working on personal projects, or creating content like I do. For .NET developers, Rider is an absolute game changer. Whether you're building web applications, games, or mobile apps with Xamarin, Rider has you covered with a fast, feature-rich cross-platform IDE. 
It supports everything from debugging to running unit tests, and even integrates with game engines like Unity and Unreal Engine. For web developers, WebStorm is perfect for all your JavaScript and TypeScript projects. It's ready to use out of the box, so you can dive into coding without worrying about configuring extensions. It's incredibly fast and helps simplify complex workflows like refactoring and navigating large complex code bases. So if you're working with .NET, JavaScript, TypeScript, or just looking for a smoother development experience, grab your free copy of Writer and WebStorm and jump right in. This isn't a limited trial. You'll be getting the full professional grade IDE completely free. Check out the link in the video description and try them out today. And thank you to JetBrains for sponsoring this video. Now back to the video. How do we handle our single database server problem? This is where we start to look at replication, specifically database replication. The idea here is simple. You start with one database, the primary database, which we'll refer to as the master. We then create duplicates of the master database known as slaves. Horrible terminologies, I know, but stick with me here. The master database handles all the right operations like adding, deleting, or updating data, while the slave databases are set up to handle only the read operations. This allows users to read data without affecting the primary database's performance. Several techniques are applied to make sure data written to the master is available to be read from the slave databases almost immediately. Now, because most applications read data far more often than they write it, having multiple slave databases to handle read requests helps balance the load. The master can then focus on data changes while the slaves manage the bulk of the reading tasks, keeping everything running smoothly. This setup not only improves performance by balancing reads and writes, but also adds redundancy in case one database fails. If the master database goes down, one of the slaves can be upgraded to take its place. And if all the slave databases go down, all the read operations would be moved to the master database temporarily. Now our database situation is stable, but we still have one glaring issue. Using one server to handle the UI and our API is not ideal. If there's a spike in traffic, the server might not be able to handle all the load. To mitigate this, your first instinct might be to add more resources to the server, more CPU, more memory, also known as vertical scaling. While this helps to some extent, it's not a long-term solution. Eventually, you'll hit a ceiling with how much you can scale up. There's a limit to how much memory, storage, or CPU you can add to a server. This is where we make the shift from vertical scaling to horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling is about adding more servers to distribute the load. Requests from users are now distributed to a slew of servers that share the load. But here's where things start to get more interesting. When you have multiple servers, you just can't randomly send traffic to each one. You'll need a load balancer. The load balancer ensures that incoming traffic is distributed evenly across the servers, making sure no one server is overwhelmed while others sit idle. It uses algorithms like round robin, list recently used, weighted round robin, and much more to ensure efficiency. Now your system is humming along nicely, but we can still make some optimizations. You see, a lot of traffic to your site might be requesting the same data over and over again. Why well, hit the database every time if this data has not changed? This is where caching comes into play. You can add a cache layer, something like Redis or Memcache to store frequently accessed data in memory. Instead of querying the database for every request, you serve the cache data instantly, significantly reducing response times. Let's top it up another notch. Your site is now popular with users spread across the whole world. Someone in Tokyo shouldn't have to wait for your New York based server to respond. You'll need a way to ensure optimal performance for everyone across the globe. One way you can do this is by using CDNs or content delivery networks. A CDN stores copies of static assets like images, CSS, or JavaScript on web servers across the world. When a user requests a file, they get it from the nearest CDN node, reducing latency and improving load times for users no matter where they are. Now, that's just a high level of what goes into scaling a website, but there's a lot more that goes into it and a lot of trade-offs. Scaling to millions of users isn't just about adding more servers. It's about designing a system that grows with you and your needs. It's about making smart architectural decisions every step of the way. And when done right, the experience for user number 1 million should feel as fast and seamless as it did for user number 1. That's it for this one. For those of you who are new here, my name is Uma. I am a software engineer, career coach, and a content creator. I enjoy learning and breaking down complex technical topics to make them easy for you to understand. I also coach software engineers to help them learn and increase their earning potential. If you'd like to be coached by me for technical interviews and other skills, as well as check out my courses on Git, AWS, and other technical concepts, click the link below or go to umacodes.com. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more deep dives into system designs like this. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.